Well, thanks for tuning into Talking Point. I'm your host, Neerat Shah. And on the sidelines of the JP Morgan India Investor Summit, we've got uh, Sanjay Mukim, who joins in right now. Uh, his first interaction with uh, Bloomberg Quint in his new role at JP Morgan. Sanjay, good having you. Thanks much for joining in. It's been a while that we've spoken to you, whether in your new role or in your real art. But it's an interesting time to hold uh, in an investor summit as well, especially as the COVID cases are again on the rise. What's the conversation around the summit and what is the central message that you are driving to your clients when they look at India? Hi, Nino. It's great to be on as well, you know, after being off for a couple of months. Yeah. To answer your question, yeah. the, the uh, interest in Indian equities is particularly high. I mean, if you measure it by the number of investors attending our summit, it is a record year. To my mind, part of it is driven by the fact that equities have had momentum. We can debate whether that is fundamentally because the economies are reopening or because of the liquidity tide that central banks have unleashed post the 23rd of March. But there is a sense that India is front and center of the COVID debate because we're now easily the highest daily infections in the world. If there is a reopening trade happening, let's suppose that happens because the vaccine is approved later this year, then India is expected to be a beta market into that trade. If you leave out the one or two large caps in the index, then most of the Indian equities have actually lagged the global recovery in asset prices. If you put it all together, you can kind of argue and see why interest in Indian equities is, is reasonably high at the moment. Mm. Sanjay, uh, so one, your personal assessment and then how are people viewing it? One, the personal assessment, almost every paper that I read speaks about how if there is a drop in the markets, there is a backstop because of the liquidity uh, that the Fed has unleashed and therefore it's uh, you know running amok the world, investing world. And it's almost impossible to kind of say with confidence about a time at which this will start unraveling and therefore the markets will have a problem. What's your own personal assessment having seen these, these scenarios now for a number of years? Well, uh, Neeraj, you can put it very simplistically. You know, this is, goes against theory. But the Indian multiples and valuations are in large part driven by that liquidity. So, right. You know, the global central bank. Therefore, sitting in India as well, we have to worry about what the Fed is doing, what the you know, chair, Fed chairman is saying in the, uh, in the Jackson Hole meeting, for example. All of that matters to me. Well, one lesson I've learned as a strategist being in these years in India is that I cannot use bottom-up concerns or bottom-up worries on the economy to therefore suggest that the Indian equity market would fall. We can argue it's overvalued for a variety of fundamental reasons, but then to predict that the market will fall is not entirely correct or has not been entirely correct for the last several years. And to my mind, unless inflation picks up globally and in the developed world or the US, this liquidity surplus is likely to sustain. If that's the case and rates remain low in the developed world, then the yield hunting phenomena, the, look, the search for growth in EM will continue, which will put a backstop to Indian equities as long as that situation remains. So I agree with the sentiment personally as well and in my, in my professional research is that this liquidity sort of puts a backstop to where stock with the index or the equity as an asset class will remain. What I was saying, Neeraj, is that I still need to worry about stock selection. And the performance of stocks. And that's where the economy comes in. If growth is weak, I will have a very limited and a narrow basket of stocks to invest in. If growth is broader and economic recovery is strong, then I have a lot more options in the equity asset class. Okay. So ha having heard Jerome Powell say what he has, that even if inflation returns, the rates might stay lower, which means that we don't have to worry about that problem for the foreseeable future. So therefore, my question then is, Sanjay, uh, to the part two of your answer, which is that for now, this growth seems to be very bucketed and narrow in that sense, right? So what do you do then? Do you go hunting for slightly riskier teams with better valuations or do you hunt for value? Or are you advocating to your clients to buy the highly valued but evidently sh growth showing companies? So Neeraj, there's two ways to kind of answer your question. And that, to my mind, depends entirely on the investment horizon for the investor. If you're a long-term investor in India, if you have, a, let's say, a five to seven-year investment horizon, then you will focus on the earnings growth of that company. And in India, in whatever economic situation we are, there is always possibility of finding companies that are executing well, 
that are uh, delivering market share gains and sustainable margins. And irrespective of your entry valuations, it is likely that you will make decent compounding returns on such companies. So that requires a lot of fundamental bottom-up work on the prospects of the business, on the execution of management. However, if you're talking about equity investors which have a shorter time frame, so let's say a one-year horizon, which most of my clients typically tend to have nowadays, then we have demonstrated quantitatively in our research that it is earnings beats and earnings momentum that matters more than valuation. Right? So if you have, and you know, we've done this analysis for the top 200 companies individually, and the, and the quant analysis is reasonably clear. You can have a cheap stock with poor earnings momentum, but not make return. Or an expensive stock on headline with strong earnings momentum and still make return. This has unfortunately been the case since the liquidity taps have been opened globally. And we think that will continue to remain. So in the near term, 12 months sort of investment horizon, earnings momentum matters more than valuations. To your mind, Sanjay, and I would have a couple of macro questions towards the end. But since we've dwelled into this micro, let me just try and assess your point of view there. Uh, sure. Do you reckon that, therefore, uh, the I mean, what are the spaces that you reckon will continue to show the earnings momentum as a strategy team? Where is it that you are uh, betting your uh, put? I mean, trying to figure out where it will come in. So the first thing I'd say, Neeraj, is that a top-down answer is that there will be very few companies which will deliver momentum simply because the outlook for the economy post the lockdowns or post the vaccine is actually pretty poor. And there's a variety of reasons we can talk about why it will take time for the Indian economy to go back to that 105, 107 sort of run rate. We've possibly gone from 40 to 85, and which is why the market's gotten happy. But getting to that 100, 105, 107 will, will take longer uh, and, and probably disappoint. So the economy in itself is unlikely to be a driver of growth. Companies will have to work hard, swim against the tide and deliver that growth, okay? which means that there will be fewer sources of earning surprises. In that sort of framework, we are negative on the consumer discretionary space because our argument is that the large amount of income loss that we've seen during the pandemic will be distributed in three parts, lower savings, lower consumption, and debt defaults. We've done some work to highlight that most of the loss in income goes into lower savings and consumption, and a limited portion of it will go into debt defaults. As a result, we are actually overweight the private banks in India and underweight the discretionary names uh, from a one-year sort of time frame. Um, interesting. So uh, w I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that all sorts of consumer discretionary and including uh, the COVID-impacted names for which people are skeptical, I mean, you know, travel, tourism, uh, uh, allied spaces, they might not be in the top 200, I'm just trying to get your sense. You think all of those would be kind of on the sidelines for you? Yes, and there's an interesting uh, argument there as well. We recently conducted a consumer survey because, you know, these lockdowns and these COVID uh, restrictions will have a permanent impact on consumer behavior, or at least a semi-permanent impact on consumer behavior. And our job as investors is to try and get ahead of the change. How is consumer behavior going to change? So we conducted a bunch of consumer surveys recently, just last week, and the results are fairly interesting. The concerns on income are very high, much higher than I would have expected prior to running that survey. But, and therefore, you know, people come back and say, look, my consumption intention on discretionary items is much lower over a 12 month time period. But there is also this phenomena where a significant portion of the people we surveyed have not been able to consume for the last six months because they've been stuck at home, because they've not been you know, keen to step out to buy a car or to buy a two wheeler or some sort. And there is this possibility that whenever they feel comfortable or the lockdowns are lifted, you might see a sudden surge in volume. But this is the full phenomena of pent-up demand, it is very difficult to size, but we've seen this happen in many North Asian countries where these lockdowns have been lifted. So there is an upside risk, we would call a, it's a monthly momentum risk to these discretionary names, but that is the opportunity for you to possibly exit that space from a 12-month point of view. It certainly would not chase uh, discretionary consumption when income outlooks and consumer confidence is so weak. So then, aside of private banks, which have obviously not gone up back to the pre-COVID levels with Achmas Gusto as some of the others, there would be very limited pockets which would probably offer you uh, probable growth at a reasonable price. Would that be a fair assessment, Sanjay? 
So let me answer that question two ways, right? If you go back to my earlier uh, argument that earnings momentum matters and earnings beats and upgrades are critical to driving 12 month return, then there is actually one more space where there is potential for small upgrades in earnings, which is the IT space. And this is principally because neither the delivery of these companies in the first quarter has not been reflected into full year forecast. Analysts sell side are still skeptical of the fact that the 1Q numbers can be replicated for the remaining year. But if they are, and if the companies are just able to maintain what they did in the June quarter, then there is upgrades coming 12 months forward earnings upgrades coming for the IT companies. The concern there has been the recent appreciation of the INR. But as long as that remains stable, uh, then I think the IT companies will also deliver a bunch of earnings upgrades. So from an overweight perspective, that's the other space that we like. Uh, but yes, other than that, there are very few drivers of earning surprises naturally occurring in the economy, to my point of view. To your question on growth on reasonable price, that's the Peter Lynch screen, really. Uh, if you try and run that screen on the data that's available on Bloomberg, for example, it will be dominated by the financials again. Yeah, I mean, I actually use the term probable growth because who knows what growth could be like. But it's right. interesting. Sanjay, just a quick follow up. You reckon that uh, IT, large, mid, small, it'll be homogeneous kind of uh, uh, a growth depiction that could come in or would it be skewed towards the larger names? Well, it's difficult to anticipate this actually, uh, Neeraj, because some of the smaller ones operate in niche segments and then you've got to worry about what that each segment does. What I was saying is that from a portfolio construction point of view, we are focused on the large cap names, whether it is in financial or IT. It gives you a broader exposure to various uh, parts of the economy. Okay. So yeah, last, last question or last couple of questions. Um, as a strategist, what are the risks that worry you aside of this uh, backdrop that is uh, uh, the backstop that the Fed provides? Does, does the India-China border issue worry you at all? Does it come up in conversations or in your notes? The first immediate risk, actually, uh, apart from geopolitics, Neeraj, is the concern of renewed lockdowns. Now, this we've seen happen in other parts of the world. India, of course, you know, for the last few days, the case counts have stabilized. But if they didn't and they continue to rise, there is risk that some of the local governments in India may be forced into locking down again. And to my mind, the market is very hard-nosed. The lockdowns will matter. Economic activity drives the share market, of course. And if you see a, a resurgence of lockdowns of economic constraints, then that is a big risk to the equity sentiment in the short term. It could lead India to underperform, to my mind. I'm hoping that the geopolitics does not really escalate, that you know, we are two mature, large economies, and that through mutual uh, discussion and dialogue, whatever is happening at the border is resolved amicably. Okay. Uh, last uh, question, Sanjay. Um, keeping in, taking into account all the risks, including maybe uh, the fact that we have this big election in the US as well, plus the geopolitics and the renewed lockdowns versus the Fed thing, would you reckon that the uh, earnings surprise momentum led uh, investing uh, would see the indices also be higher than where they are right now. I know people don't have nifty futures in the portfolios, but the market levels has a psychological impact if nothing else. So you reckon 12 months from now, we could be better off than where we are right now or could we be worse off? That is actually my focus, Neeraj. We do think that over, let's say, a 12, 14 month period, we probably eke out a 10 odd percent upside on the nifty. Now, this is completely reliant. My, my estimate is completely reliant on the fact that liquidity injections by central banks will continue to remain positive. And that is the one correlation that has mattered to equity as an asset class for the last 10 odd years. And I don't see any reason for that to break now. Sanjay, amazing talking to you. Thank you so much. It's been a while. So good having you. And all the best with the conference. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Neeraj.